Just out of curiosity, who was here last year? Who saw who saw this presentation last year? About half of you all. So that was all like vaporware drawings. So hopefully, um, to see what we actually accomplished with last year. All right. So just a reminder. This is the what I'm going to go through. We have the vision and strategy for Hydra. Uh, a little bit about the system itself. How we ran the program. So that's kind of important. Like how you actually put this together within an organization and make it operational. Uh, then Dr. Holland will go over the um, Onco space, Oncoscape, and some of the Argos user interface. I'll go over that as well, and then we'll, we'll tell you what's coming next. So this project was, was started for a few reasons, for a few strategic drivers. One, that the next generation of research that we wanted to do at the center uh, had to span across multiple repositories. So it's not just research about prostate cancer and lung cancer and breast cancer separately. It's all together. So if we find, um, if we find things in molecular data that cross multiple cancers, that we have the system structured to, to uh, research those kinds of questions. So that was one of the driving factors behind, behind the Hydro project. And the other was uh, the increasing regulation and security around, around uh, patient data, keeping data confidential. Confidential. So um, when we started this project, we didn't have quite the right infrastructure for to scale out and create more risk with data. We had the right protections in place as well. So those were some of the drivers. So vision overall in terms of uh, scope and types of data in Hydra with these four axes, things about a, a patient or subject, things about their biospecimens, the studies or clinical trials that they're on, or molecular or other assay data. And I'm pretty generic about the assay data. It could be molecular data, it could be um, biometric data, Fitbit data, cost data, any other kinds of data sets associated with, the, with this population. The population that we're talking about for Hydra is the cancer consortium patients. So that's about, well now we have new estimates. We thought it was about 150,000 historical patients, five or 6,000 even per year. As of yesterday, it looks like 300,000 plus historical patients, five or 6,000 new. That's including like the screening, the screening populations. And the goals for this project overall enable us to learn from every one of these patients who walks through the, the door and to uh, integrate that, that knowledge back into clinical care as soon as possible to so make it fast to acquire that data, fast to analyze that data. Then, um, to, to reach this kind of scale, you can imagine trying to do data entry on 300,000 patients would be impossible. So we wanted to leverage some new technology, some of the natural language processing technology, being very efficient about the way we do, do data abstraction, doing uh, quality assurance, uh, as well as linking to uh, other sources of data like um, the cancer surveillance system, the social security death master file, ways to um, to aggregate quite a bit of data about that large population without getting swamped in, in data entry. And last but not least, as I mentioned before, we needed to be uh, compliant with the latest regulations. So we're aiming for a, a FISMA level compliance, the, the federal security standards. And I, I believe that's led to uh, Brit's first, one of Brit's slides about LabKey becoming able to handle HIPAA and BAAs and all of those things learning curve for all of us. So a little bit about the system it, itself. This is where we started three years ago, roughly two and a half years ago. It's been a while now. This is a simplified, a very simplified diagram of the systems at the Hutch maybe three years ago. So you see on the, the left hand side we've got, I can get mobile here since my pointer doesn't work on these screens. These, uh, these are all the systems at the University of Washington. We have Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, Seattle Children's, and the Hutch is the, the part in the middle. All four of these together make up the, the Fred Hutch UW Cancer Consortium. So these are clinical systems, electronic medical records. They're, they're the medical legal record used for clinical decision making on individual patients. They're not really structured for research. However, um, University of Washington has put together an cl integrated clinical data warehouse in Microsoft Amalga. Now, Caradigm SIP 
platform. So they slurp in all these HL7 and other types of data into a SQL Server database. Um, that was the state of the art, say, two or three years ago. That's, and that still pretty much exists. There's about 40 different systems. This is just a subset. Then the SCCA, the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, which also has the outpatient clinic. They have a few other systems, such as uh, lab vision for some specialized laboratory tests, the radiation oncology system, and then we Seattle Children's has some comparable systems. They have their own medical record, their own research systems. So we had all of these spaghetti diagram of data feeds going from different systems. And our goal, well, and also we had individual repositories for things like there's a breast database, there's a prostate database, there's a transplant database. So our goal with Hydra was to consolidate those all and make these flows of data a little bit more rational so that if you did reports from different systems, you'd get the same results. And it would, it would all be wrapped in a tighter security layer. The other factor that came into the Hydra was uh, natural language processing. So in the analysis of requirements for the Hydra project, we reached out to all of the different cancer disease groups across the consortium and asked for data dictionaries, existing databases, or if they didn't have that, then what are the elements that are important to you for your research? That was about 14,000 elements across 13 groups and 20-some-odd uh, disease subgroups. We spent a summer condensing those and normalizing those elements to figure out which ones were duplicates, which ones were masquerading under other names. And then boil that down to about 4,000 that were actually unique. And of those, we, we looked at each one to see where are the opportunities for automation. So one, is it coming from a structured source already, like lab values and demographics that are already structured? Or is it coming from clinical notes? It's coming from unstructured. Could it be reported by the patient themselves? Is it something that they, they walk into the clinic knowing? Or could it be computed from other values? So either any of these three methods could be doing, dealing with unstructured data, dealing with patient-reported data, or dealing with computing other elements could be a way to automate, um, automate the data acquisition and processing. And we found out 65% of the data elements that were important for the researchers were coming from unstructured sources. So path reports, clinic notes, this is probably familiar to, to most of you. Um, around the same time, another group, I don't have the reference here, but um, the other group did a similar analysis and came up with about 80%. We were very conservative in our estimate. Um, so somewhere between 65 to 80% of the elements are coming from unstructured sources. That's our reason to really push for natural language, for using natural language processing, text processing techniques. Britt, would you like me to do questions during the middle or in where? Let me stop at this point and see if there's any questions we've talked about so far. Yes? I noticed you had HL7 loaded and otherwise, is that structure helpful at all or not? The, because they can add a step totally different issues. Right, right. So we, we took advantage of the, the Amalga system and they already did the parsing of of the HL7 messages into a SQL database. So, um, and then each of the sources, as you know, like pathology HL7 messages would be different, slightly different content than the lab systems. So, um, we relied on them for the, the, the processing and the, you know, the syntax of it, dealing with the syntax, and then the meaning um, we had to sort out persist by system. No, we're not doing the HL7 processing with the marquee. Any other questions? All right. So here's the program, how we, how we structured building out Hydra. We conceptualized it as a core platform uh, with SQL Server on the, the back end, uh, which ties in nicely with the, the about the platform, which is also SQL Server, and some of our end user systems, which is SQL Server. We looked at a variety of other systems before jumping to this, this decision. Um, and we also looked at, at quite a few vendors before we, we jumped with, with LabKey a couple of years ago. 
So um, the core platform is supposed to be SQL Server with uh, with LabKey as the as the uh, middle layer, and uh, LabKey as the, the part that allows us to track the security or track who's seeing what data, so that we can report uh, report any disclosures or any possible um, anything that's released to another system that we can report on and audit. So that's the core platform, and then on top of that core platform, we envisioned applications, which are like the end user interfaces for for investigators and clinicians. And the first of those applications is the Argos platform, which I'll, I'll show you in a second. So that was the end user interface, and then another one that, that Dr. Holland will, will show you is a Onco Oncoscape. It's another example, and then I'll describe how those those two are related. So this is a rough program map, thanks to Sarah Ramsey, who many of you know. Um, this is where we're going over the next few years, our best guess of how this program is going to evolve over the next couple of years. The core platform is pretty much up and running. Sarah, when is that going to be released? A couple of weeks from now? November 15th, the core goes live. And and then it's not done yet, but at least it's, it's up and functioning fully. Um, so the core needs to evolve to in incorporate new data feeds. Uh, the core also needs to continue to increase the security protections. We're actually trying to construct a uh, concept of a, what are we calling it now, panic room, clean room, <laughs> high security environment, panic room. So a high security environment within the Hutch system that, is, that has additional layers of protection for the, any data that has, that has uh, patient information, protected information. So, and that goes all the way from the, the application level down to the network and storage level. It would be a complete high security environment. Um, we also want to build in a set of analytic tools over the Hydra Core using the LabQ platform so that, um, so that analysts on Sarah's team can, can access any of the data across the, the back end of the system. So the, the applications that will be running on this system won't necessarily reveal everything that's underneath it. But we'll, we'll still use LabKey for accessing all of the underlying data. So you can think of the back end like the warehouse and the front end is the application. The uh, second part is Argos. That's the user interface. The big feature development coming up, um, we'll, we'll rewind. The first version of Argos, we did a brain pilot starting in we designed at the end of 2013, so it was, it was just being conceptualized when this meeting was happening last year. That's why you saw the vaporware screens. Um, we started developing at the beginning of this year, and we used, uh, because Dr. Holland uh, arrived and started at the Solid Tumor Translational Research Program and the Brain Tumor Center, we, we decided to focus in on the brain cancer population first for the pilot. So the pilot had a couple phases, and both of those are done as of this fall. That's that's up and running at this point. Where where Argos is going next is um, extending to multiple disease groups. Ultimately, it's going to extend across the whole the whole center. And uh, we left out some of the automation in the pilot. So now we're we're building in an enterprise level natural language processing pipeline. I actually think of it as a pipeline that can work for both the data abstraction and the natural language processing together. Just an overall more efficient way to, to acquire data and process it into the right format. Then uh, some re related efforts that are going to need to tie in. We still haven't dealt with the um, outcomes data, long-term follow-up data. By this I mean the interaction after somebody leaves the center. They, they come in for a treatment and they go into the, back to the community for follow-up care, how do, we, how do we maintain a relationship with them? How do we use uh, the, the platform to um, reach out to them, acquire patient reported data, and see how they're doing over time? Um, that part has not, been, has not been built out yet. That's on the, on the roadmap. Specimen management, there's, that is also on the roadmap, but not done yet. There are dozens of systems at the Hutch for specimen management and we're in the process of trying to consolidate this. And uh, the last two, clinical trial management system, 
the Cancer Consortium has been looking to, enter, to implement an enterprise-wide clinical trial management system. We've been having discussions for the last year or so, and those are, those are still going on. You know, working with four institutions, it's going to take us a while to get there, but we estimate around uh, end of 2015, early 2016, we'll start to implement a clinical trial management system across the whole consortium, and Hydra will need to integrate with that because we'll need to report on you know, which people are on which studies as well as which specimens associate with those. It's one of the, the axes of Hydra. And the last is the assay data. So uh, Dr. Holland's group and STTR has been accumulating some some assay data for, for prototyping some visualization techniques, uh, but we haven't dealt in Hydra with storing large volumes of, of assay data and integrating those. What is that? What should that interface look like? Um, so you'll see maybe some ideas for, for dealing with that later. Any questions on the roadmap? Yeah. That'd be fantastic. Uh, where where are you? Great. I've been looking at quite a few um, options for CTMS, but it would be it would be great to find collaborators. Other questions on the roadmap of the program itself? Yes. That's a good question. <laughs> so lab key is the is the technology. Hydra is the this uh, it's the name for this installation, this program, this installation and the implementation of the whole system, including lab key, but also including the whole operations around it. So it's the local instance. So uh, but we're relying on lab key for the technology. There are technology partner, the middle layer, there's other components. So it's been some of those Argos is an application built in LabKey, and it and it it sits on top of the the Hydra Core platform. So all of these pieces are meant to run all together under the name Hydra, but um, but there's modules or components within that. And when I when I say Hydra, I mean the technology, but I also mean the the program, the operations, uh, the the team that supports it, the the whole the whole. Whole ball of wax, if you will. Yes, question. So the part of the integration here, the patient with the data, have you do you guys have some idea how you do it? Ideas, but we haven't done a thorough analysis of those yet. And there are several candidates. There, there are people who do this with RedCap out there. There are dozens of, of homegrown applications. You know, every every center. Maybe even every lab that does uh, patient research will build a survey tool of some kind. So there's lots of options out there. We, we just haven't done the thorough analysis of which one would fit, fit best for us. Yes, question? For your uh, collection of items and natural language process, do you discuss something about the technology or use for that? <laughs> Typically, when you do something like that, you'll have some kind of holistic statement that gives an estimate of how reliable this result was. You'll have a whole range of probabilities for the various data elements that you end up generating. So downstream, when you have these somewhat reliable, in some quantitative way, data, how do you use those data in a way that acknowledges that uncertainty? That's a great point. Yeah, each one of the algorithms in natural language processing, like imagine on a field level basis, so you're extracting, say, histology from a pathology report. That individual field has a confidence level based on the training of the algorithm and the validation of the algorithm. So our plan is to actually uh, track that and assign it. When, when the algorithm extracts a piece of data, we keep with that the the uh, confidence that it got that correct confidence level. Um, and we'll track that in the back end of the system. We, um, I don't know if it will be available like fully on the front end because it might get overly complex, but if we do want the full provenance of the data and the reliability to be 
easily discoverable, so somebody should be able to drill back and see what the confidence level, which exact algorithm was run and what the confidence level was for that algorithm. That's a lot of that. Yeah, it is. We have a simple problem where we have an animal that has heritage. Mm -hmm. And that heritage is probabilistic segment. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And that gets complicated by our heritage too. <laughs> Yeah, um, that is. Yeah, it is. Actually, animal animal models is really interesting. Uh, we haven't dealt. We have obviously we haven't we haven't dealt with that piece yet, but we we will. I know some of the the children's cancers have to be detailed family history, and there's those trees. Um, but basically, yes, it's a lot of metadata, and we we are putting the structure in place to, to track each sort, each element all the way back through everything that was done to it, to the source. We haven't dealt with the tree, tree based ones, but probably will, like the animal models. Did they answer your question okay or did it? Yeah, yeah, it just sounds like a fun job. <laughs> <laughs> you want to come work for us? <laughs> I think we have a couple of them. Other questions on the, the project or program? Yeah, I think we're we're close to that now. It's not like a not like a, a, a hard point where you you cross and you say now we are we are now totally physical compliant. It's more a continuously addressing the risks and improving it and documenting it so that if if an audit comes that we're ready for it, whatever state we're in. So, um, haven't put that on the schedule yet. That's been talked about quite a, quite a bit. So, we, we are interested in that. It's just when and when, when it makes sense to do that it would be most valuable. Yeah, <laughs> it was heartburn. I think it was heartburn for Brit too. Uh, two years ago, it was heartburn for all of us. But we said we have to do this to be competitive. And now it doesn't seem like that much heartburn. We've got quite a bit of the structure and the documentation in place. People know what to do. We've been through some close calls and found that things worked. So, uh, so I think that was that was a process. Other questions? I know you'll want to get to the good parts. So, legal and IRB framework. This was this was critical it's to instead of getting caught in every every other week or so in in IRB issues about can we pull this data or how do we how do we interact with these different data sets or the the legal aspects of sharing data across these organizations. We did this proactively. We spent most of 2013 working on a memorandum of understanding for data sharing, so a new legal agreement between the four partner institutions. And that was signed off at, in December of, of last year. So that basically uh, covers the, the HIPAA authorization side of, of sharing data. It creates a, a, a legal data sharing agreement. It also puts in place the business associate agreements that, that Britt spoke about earlier. So prior to this framework, the Hutch, well, the Hutch is not considered a covered entity. We don't provide patient care. But um, under these business associate agreements, now we have to treat the data that we receive from our partners, UW, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, uh, children. We have to treat that data as if we were a covered entity. So that chain of trust now extends to us. So I, I try to represent that with this funky cell diagram so to have this idea of a membrane there's only certain ways in, there's only certain ways out, um, and they're governed by things. So the way to get data into Hydra has to be covered under this business associate agreement. Um, the ways to get out is also governed partly under that, and then partly under IRB files. So um, after we finished the legal agreement, we uh, revised the IRB files. There, there were about, gosh, half half a dozen, maybe more files, and dozens of modifications to get these all coordinated so that they all would work with an integrated repository. 
So we, we created a Hydra master IRB file. Uh, Dr. Holland is the, the PI of that, of that file. And then uh, over the last year, since, since, the, since um, last December, we've been taking the files that govern the sub-repositories across the institution and asking the IRB permission uh, with a waiver of consent and a waiver of authorization permission to integrate that data with, to put that repository under the Hydra umbrella. And that the same security protections would apply to that, that repository. Um, the same gatekeeping mechanisms would apply to that repository. So that's been an ongoing effort. It's not, it's not done, but the big parts of it are, are done. The largest repositories are now done. Uh, so, so, and then the ways that, that data can come out of this repository legitimately are only these. Uh, so, healthcare operations, quality improvement, quality assurance, those are on the clinical side. So, it is possible, we wrote this into the agreements, that this data could be used for those purposes. However, uh, that is governed by our clinical partners. So, we wouldn't do that. The Hutch, as a research institute, would not be doing healthcare operations on our own, but we might be doing it as a business associate of our partner, or they, they govern that relationship, or they govern that use. The uses for the Hutch would be research with consents, research with a waiver, or uh, research operations, including things like activities preparatory to research, data use, um, just running and auditing a, a database. So these are the uses that we govern. And then there are a few other pieces that were built into the agreements, like one, uh, we have a EAA with LabKey that, so that now any data that comes from the UW, their BAA allows it to come into the Hydra environment, and then the BAA with LabKey, which was also approved all the way back to UW, allows them to be your technical partner and, and uh, see some of that, that data. So that's all controlled. The other use is public health or other mandatory reporting, which is also governed on the clinical side. So legal, legal agreement covers operations, these things, and the IRB file covers research uses. The IRB file also covers um, adding other data to Hydra, like abstraction, abstracting additional things from medical records, obtaining outside medical records from um, for follow-up bringing those into the system, linking to data like the uh, cancer surveillance system, social security death master file. The IRB file is meant to govern those things that are outside of the realm of, of the environment. So this is trying to get a comprehensive legal and IRB framework, which has been super useful for us. We use this framework like every week. Any questions on this? Yes. How much of this procedural intervention is technology? Wait. I think it's, it's like, I think it's more than half of it's procedural. There was quite, I mean, there was quite a bit of technology to put into place to, to audit things and to put the controls in place, make sure there's no place you know, way around it. So a um, huge amount of the investment in LabKey over the last year for us was to put in all of those technical controls. It's not, it's pretty significant. Um, going forward, though, I think most of the investment is, is operational. It's getting the policies and procedures and then sort of, yeah, it does. It breaks down on the people side. So it's all got to work. It's all got to work together. I think largely going forward, it's, it's operational. It's in, it's in Sarah Ramsey's group. Any other questions on that? All right. So we based, uh, we used the cases project, um, which uh, we started at, or started at Sloan Kettering. We used that as a starting data model for this because it, it works for modeling cancer. It might not work for those of you who are not doing cancer. Um, however, we did borrow a lot of the, the concepts for Hydra and Argos from the collaborative data spaces and other lab key projects from a different world. So, so it should translate to, to other things. Just for cancer, we have to use this as a stepping stone system. Um, here's another system diagram that shows Hydra environment, all the source databases that we feed from. Hydra is, is a repository. Right now, it's actually a 
multiple repositories that are acting together, so it's not just one database. It's an ecosystem, as we like to call it. And on top of that, we use some processed areas of data marks, or as, as Sarah, um, Sarah came up with, the curated queues. And Argos application, user interface that runs on top of it, and there will be other applications that are either closely integrated part of the Hydra environment or integrated with the Hydra environment but not, not part of it. So like CTMS might not be part of the Hydra environment, but it needs to be integrated with Hydra. So natural language processing pipeline, I mentioned we want to think of data acquisition and processing across the whole enterprise, not just it's not just implement a couple algorithms here and there. It's think about all the data that's coming into the system, whether it's being manually entered or processed by somebody. And how do we organize a pipeline for doing that across a scale of now 300,000, up to 300,000 people? So we wanted to think of the abstractors and algorithms as somewhat interchangeable, not competing, but working together so that, let's say, an example task would be would be um, if, you, if you don't have an algorithm in place, let's say for extracting stage from lung cancer reports, we would first need one or two abstractors to generate some training data. So we would set up a queue, a queue of documents for them to abstract, and, and then the set of elements that we wanted them to abstract to create a training set. And the train has the first pass through this pipeline. That, gen, that training set, it goes offline to develop an algorithm, the second pass is to implement the algorithm but have a, a validation phase. So the second second wave would be algorithm, documents come in, the algorithm runs and, and extracts fields from the document, and then an abstractor comes in and verifies that those fields are correct and makes corrections to those. All of that training data is, is captured as well, so that then we can refine the algorithm if needed. And then long term, once we've got a high performing algorithm or high performing fields, um, you still want some auditing over, over time, still want some QA process over time. So you may say all lung cancer pathology reports go through this algorithm and 5% of those uh, were the ones that the confidence score was below a certain threshold we have reviewed by a, by a person. So we're thinking of the people and the algorithms working together in this, this comprehensive pipeline, which is currently under development. And one of the, the key screens of that is the abstraction or the QA screen, where conceptually you can think of this as a two, two screen, the source document, which we're pulling in from the medical record, and the fields that the person, the abstractor, or the algorithm is trying to get out of it. In this, this instance, it was an example of algorithm has gone through first and pulled out some values. The algorithm's also highlighted the snippets of text that it used to make a certain decision. And then the person, the abstractor or reviewer, can review that, make changes, and verify that they're, they're done with that. So that's just a, a snapshot. This, this pipeline has just started development, uh, starting with, with pathology reports. I imagine over the next year, this will be the biggest area of development for the back end of the system. Questions on that? We're actually doing, um, we're using just a variety of, of open source systems and some Python scripting. We happen to be really lucky in Seattle because uh, University of Washington Computational Linguistics Program churns out a bunch of uh, master's level students who uh, familiar with a wide range of tools and can write scripts really easily. So, um, and they're they have kind of the same methodology. So, we're relying on that as probably the fastest and, and cheapest way to get these algorithms up and running. For centers that don't have that kind of expertise on hand, there are other companies. You know, uh, Linguomatics is used at a lot of cancer centers. There's other companies out there. Sure. <laughs> I think this technology is well established. When I when I first got here, it was it, and I was trying to tell the story that it was it's mature. We could use it. Um, it was very unfamiliar. 
it's too close. But I think now that we've had some, a couple years of experience of projects, it's, most people realize that it's fairly mature. There's still a lot of research into into um, natural language processing for healthcare, but um, 80 to 90 percent of what we need is kind of standard stuff. It's not that, that cutting edge. Sure. Other questions? All right. Actually, yes. So that software actually available probably on the website. It will be through the we're releasing everything back to the LabKey platform, so it will be all uh, available through the LabKey platform. And then anything else that's touch specific, uh, yeah. I think unless it's the data itself about patients that we have to keep confidentiality, all the system stuff and documentation stuff, we're, we're free to share that. We jump through the interface and then um, and then we'll do the the Uncas case. So Argos interface, this is just a quick snapshot. It was vaporware last time, and this is the, the brain group. So here's the idea that you would jump into the system and either browse all patients or a disease-specific group. In this case, we were starting with the brain group. Eventually, we'll be able to jump in by a study population. And this is kind of a security portal so you can see what subset of data. Then you choose your activity. Why are you going into the system? These map back to those legal agreements, map back to the IRB files. So you, you specify your use and you specify your level of identification. By default, it's all de identified coded for people who have the role or a specific project that can add the identifiers back in. We built in the um, confidentiality pledge into the system. And then you're in. So, all that security and regulatory stuff on the back end, we kind of do that correctly, but make it fairly transparent. Yeah, yeah. And it's all logged, just like a medical record. See everything that you're doing in the sandbox. Um, Eric, do you want to join me up here so you can make comments on this as well? The brain group, <laughs> make it interactive. This is the brain brain dashboard that we put in place. It's the brain cancer population. I think there's like seven. 100 patients that have been fully curated, about 1,700 total, including all the specimens, and we're customizing the interface to the, the needs of the, the disease-specific group. You can look, you can see this looks very similar to the collaborative data spaces project. Uh, you can pivot around the four axes of Hydra, like patients, specimens, studies, assays. Here's a, a screenshot of the finding something by, by things about a patient. And it's just a, a it's just a super easy click and and filter. So we're clicking in this case um, people who've had external beam radiation therapy. And you can see on the right hand side as you click those, you've got the number of patients who meet that filter, the number of associated specimens, the number of studies. Eventually, it'll have, there's a placeholder for assay data as well, and the filters are accumulating over here. I'm going to go through this rather rapidly since we have some we have 20 minutes left. Uh, we're also building in. Let's see. Here's a, here's another example of a, another field: the uh, demographics. So in this case, we're selecting females or people that we don't know their their gender. People always ask, like, why are there three genders? That's why. Maybe more. Uh, once you've selected a, or filtered out a subset, then we have this, this concept of not doing a lot of extensive analysis within, within Argos itself, but some quick visualizations. So here's a survival curve of that population versus the, the all brain patient populations. So in this case, it's the females or unknown gender who've had external beam radiation versus all, all patients. I don't think that's a meaningful question, but that's just an example. Uh, and then you can change the you can change the comparison groups on the survival curves. So this is still being iteratively developed. One of my favorite features that is just coming out this month is the uh, clinical trial accrual estimation. <laughs> so given the set of filters that you've applied, how many patients walk through the door to meet those criteria? and that you would have known at the time. So it's trying to simulate if I were trying to run a study, 
how long would it take me to accrue? Would I actually be able to accrue people to that study? Um, so that's, that one is really fun. And then once you've selected a, a group or filtered out a set, you can also use the column chooser to build out a full data grid. You can get back to uh, Lackey's bread and butter, the grids, grids everywhere. There's the grid, grid everywhere. But it's coded, it's de-identified. Um, auditing going on in the back to see who's seen what when. That's the difference between this grid and the previous 5G grids, is it's, is it's operating within a fully regulated environment. Okay. And the last one I just wanted to show you, just a snapshot of one of the other sections. It's like we were filtering things about a patient. We could do the same kind of interface for specimens that's up and running, and then we're working on the filtering by things about a study. So here we can see that population. There were a variety of different sponsors of studies. Also, this particular um, UI not really facilitating data out. It does facilitate data out. It's um, simple data out, so it's not the super complex queries. If you can write a filter and select some columns on here, then you see that little request export. There will be the ability to get data out if you have the permission to get data out. That if data leaves the system, it leaves our sandbox, it leaves the auditing, so we have extra procedural controls in place. It has a person actually reviewing that. Yes, this is okay to remove this because the, when it leaves, we have to verify that, that its destination has the right controls in place procedurally and technically at this moment. So, so the export of data has more to do about the operations and procedures. And now to introduce Dr. Holland and go over the Oncoscape application. And the way these, these interact uh, is that Argos is, is the part that's intended to run across the whole hydro population in a protected environment with all the security controls in place. It's, so it takes a while to put this all in, in place. Um, Oncos, Oncoscape is like the innovation lab where you're trying out new ways to visualize data and seeing what works and moving very fast but doesn't have all the same controls in place. And I think the idea over time is that, is that when when something really resonates on the Oncos, Oncoscape side, that we, that we think about moving that into the hydro environment. And, and over time, we think about how these, how these can interact more tightly. I don't know if you'd like to check that out. So, uh, I guess one way to think about Oncoscape and Argos is Argos is like a CLIA certified laboratory uh, where the things are done in a very specific way and very useful and, and legally, you know, Fits all the all the bills, and Oncoscape is a, a research laboratory, like a sandbox, where you can just do all kinds of crazy things that may or may not be reproducible, and so on and so forth. But once you think you've got something really important, you then come up with a, a clear certified way of doing that. So, and that and that would be popping it over and rewriting it into into uh, uh, into, into Argos language. So, so the idea here is that is that you would have uh, again. Um, a whole lot of clinical data uh, in a, in a patient-centric sort of way, and then a whole lot of other stuff, uh, molecular data. And how do you put that all together? How do you see it? Um, and you know, different people are different. Some people really like tables. And I don't like tables. I like to look at stuff. I like to visualize things, play with it, and then I understand it. Um, and so that's kind of what this is. And so, so Argos, I mean, um, Oncoscape, um, is actually something that is, you know, under development. This highlight in red uh, is, is is real. It seems to change by the week, um, but it, but it's actually available. You can log in and play with it yourself. And we're actually we're hoping to get many people outside of our group to start writing plugins and play with it and make suggestions. And and, and we're we're very responsive to new ideas. Um, but so here, here's one, and, and what I'm going to do is go through some screenshots. I could actually do it live, but I was afraid it might crash. <laughs> um, so I'm doing screenshots. Uh, so, um, so one of the tabs here is clinical timelines. Uh, and so the clinical timelines, uh, if you imagine a patient um, and, 
being born here and having a diagnosis of X here and then eventually dying out here. And there's a whole lot of stuff that acts along the way, a linear timeline. Um, and then that's that's what happened to that patient. And then you, the next patient has a similar series of things happen to them. And then there's hundreds of patients like that. You can line them all up in a horizontal fashion. And what you're looking at here is kind of a mess, but, but the horizontal lines here are patients were born at such and such a date in blue dots, and then they reach the end of their diagnosis of cancer, and then they die. And a whole lot of stuff happens at the end. And if you sort of reorganize this, and this is all stuff you just click and pops up. These are literally screenshots. Um, and it, you know, if you get rid of the, the birthday and you simply put the years on there, then you start to see things happen. But what you really like to do is sort of line people up by diagnosis, right? So um, you then click on diagnosis, you align by diagnosis, and bang. So now that, that line, the brown line, is each patient was diagnosed on that date. They had surgery, they turned out to have, in this case, this data set is a glioma data set, uh, but this could be any cancer type, right? Um, and so they had surgery on that day, they were diagnosed with glioma, and then, and you'll, you'll see that it's a log scale time down below. And so, uh, then, so the next thing that happens, you start to get an MRI scan, postoperatively, and then you have radiation, which is this purple line, uh, and that's how long the radiation lasts, and you have chemotherapy, and you have progression, and so on and so forth. It's still kind of a mess, right? But you can, uh, you can uh, order them now by survival. And so now, all of a sudden, you begin to see what it really looks like. And so what this is, is a standard Kaplan-Meier survival curve, uh, actually two of them, and I'll talk about that in a second. But the big one at the bottom um, is if you come, you know, at the beginning, 100% of the patients are alive, and then they fall off, and eventually none of the patients are alive. But now you can actually see, this is how this disease is treated. This is like three or 400 patients, and you just see it. That's what it is. And it turns out the reason there's two of them is because not all of these people are dead yet. Uh, so if you click on status, you realize that the people above are not dead yet, and what those are are, are people at their last clinic visit. Uh, and then once they die, then they will become part of the lower curve here. And then you can you know, ask for other things like time to progression, which is now a line, uh, the, the turquoise thing on the left. So you know, the amount of time uh, to progression from surgery and radiation, and then the tumor comes back because it always does, how long does it take? Um, uh, and you, not surprisingly, the patients at the bottom had the longest time to progression because they lived the longest. It's not terribly surprising, but this time it comes coming right out of the day without putting any effort in there. And what you can see also uh, here, there's a little box here, and it's, this is totally interactive. And so you can reach down and you can grab this group of patients or this group of patients um, and export those patients to some other query, like what mutations do they have? What, you know, can I study that group specifically? Um, and so here we're going to then export this group of patients um, to a another field here, which is called markers in something or another. Markers in patients, I guess. So what this page, what this um, field book is, and so, so all this is clinical. And that, now we have but every one of these patients has you know molecular data associated. So now we can pull those patients out and, and throw all the molecular data in them to this plot here. So, so this is a plot where each of the dots here represents a gene that has been published to be important in glioma, brain tumors. Uh, and each of these dots um, are patients. Um, and they fall into the various subgroups of glioma. They just have names. It doesn't really matter. Um, but the, up here, the mesenchymal ones are, are green. But the ones that have been turned yellow, those are the patients that live the longest, that, that little group that we, we uh, pulled out. Now you see them here as you get yellow dots. So now what you want, what we're going to do here is then we're going to simply ask the question, you know, which mutations did that one have, this one have, and collectively, what mutations did the patients that live the longest have? And so you, you put the edges in. You put the edges in, and all of a sudden it looks like that. And now the genes in yellow, these are the genes associated with those patients that had the longest survival. Um, and, you know, so there's other toilet things you can do, you can play around with this, you can, you can also take this group of patients, for example, you take this group of genes and study it specifically, but you can take the group of patients and do something else with them, which is a, um, to apply it to a PCA plot. So here, this PCA plot looks like this, 
Um, and here, now each one of these dots is a patient's tumor. And the location on this principal component analysis plot uh, is relative to the similarity that that patient has molecularly to other patients. And so this tumor is very similar to that tumor, so it's very different than these tumors, for example. Like the different colors are these different subgroups of glioma, and they're all just sort of scattered across this PCA plot. But the larger dots are the ones that live longer. So just without doing any work here, you can realize that those patients who did longer didn't really fall into one specific place on a PCA plot. But other things you can do, uh, you can pick specific genes uh, and ask the question, who are they connected to? So here's EGFA and, and NF1, and, and when you do that, you can do the edges, and you can say, okay, these, these are just two interesting genes for various reasons, and you realize that, that this mutation in, in NF1 is very frequently associated with this group, uh, and the, uh, the PDGFRA is very, so very frequently associated with this group, although a little bit over here as well. So these are all, these are all just, I'm just showing you some snapshots. There's things you can do. This is quick, you know, is, you can do this as fast as I'm just talking about that. Um, uh, so other things you can do. You can take the, the group of, a, a group of tumors, for example, or, uh, associated with a particular set of, of mutations, um, and then you can apply them to this plot, which is a pathway plot. And the pathway plot is going to be scary when you first see it, but it's a bunch of mutations that are all associated with glioma and how those mutations are connected in pathways, molecular biology pathways, that matter. And so, you, you know, you can't read all this, but these are all, these are all sort of parts of biology that are all connected uh, uh, because of the kinds of genes that are there. And those are mutations that are found in in these tumors, and you can, for a subset of tumors, you can actually, you know, I highlight a particular area like this, just pull it out, and that's where the NF1 and PGFA, the RA that I showed you, show up in this particular group of signal transduction pathways. But then, um, so there they are, um, but now you can actually then scroll through that particular group of tumors, like a movie, it's like this is 50, 15 of them, it's one after the other, and it will highlight the mutations in this Space. So I'm just going to roll through it. As you see things popping up, these are where these mutations are are actually showing up. And just to cut it short. But it's also interactive in the sense that if you click on one of these lines, and you say, "Well, you know, is this really connected?" I mean, you're taking it for, you know, for granted that the person who curated this is actually right. Uh, you actually click on it, and you end up with a PubMed um, uh, citation to that particular connection between HDF and MED. Um, so, you know, it's really easy to do the science, that kind of thing. Um, so, um, what else? Oh, is this connected to chromosomes also? A lot of stuff that you don't need to know about. And I guess, I guess the, last, the last thing to show you here, I'm not sure, um, is, is something called, is a PL, PLSR plot. We're here we're actually have molecular and, and clinical stuff all connected. Um, and we're asking, so each one of these dots is two different data sets, one a very large data set and a smaller data set of a lot of patients, but, but a, a, a smaller group of genes associated the expression space. But, but here what this is, um, is asking for each dot here, which is a gene, how is it associated with survival uh, and age and diagnosis? And so these, these axes sort of point in direction, and the location of the gene is, with respect to those axes, tells you whether that gene is really associated in these various populations with a bad outcome. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Each one, each each side is a gene. In fact, if, if it was live, I could just mouse over each one, and it would pop up. Tell you what the gene that was. Uh, you can actually come in here and select a group of genes do something with it. But the, but the genes over here turn out to be associated with, with more survival um, when they're altered. Okay. And the only reason I'm, I'm showing you this here and here is because this, this is a gene that we already knew from one of the advantage doing it in gliomity is that I know the biology, so it's not just gibberish to me. So sure enough, this thing shows up and it's actually a very good marker for bad survival. Um, and it just falls out without doing any work. Um, So, <laughs> okay, so um, 
So I just I just skipped this. This is the validation to that, that, that. So um so so that's the kind of stuff and there's a lot more that is in this time time limited. Uh, but that's the kind of stuff that we're like trying to really figure out if we can design systems that will easily by point and click teach you about seeing how do you see big data, you know, kind of binocular. Anything that's really, really useful, like for example the clinical timelines that I showed you at the beginning, that's all going to get written into the Argo space. And so that is something that clinicians can look at. Um, you know, they're not going to want to put on this data, they're not quite sure what they make, and so on. But once it's really written right and scalable and so on, that's a that's a tool that would be very useful. And others will come that way. So that's the big vision. Maybe we'll see if there's there's any questions over the whole user interface. Any questions over like the Argos interface, the Argos data interface, the interactions of these? It's, it's in our overall strategy. Yes? This is more for data analysis. One of the things you'd like to be able to do is to, you know, do that on the subset of the data and then see if that's the same action. This is the further data. Is that part of your plan? Yes, yeah, so so for the glioma space, we actually have three different data sets, completely independent, uh, with actually different strengths and weaknesses, some of the clinical data, some of the molecular data, some bigger sets, and so on. But that absolutely has to happen. You have to, you know, come up with, and what we're actually planning on doing is being able to select a subset of genes in one data set, and then apply it to the other sets, you know, to really figure out, you know, what holds the water and what doesn't. But you're, you're right. You need, you need a lot of patients, and you need multiple sets to validate. Good question. Yes. This was what I'm talking about. I'm going to show that coding would be part of the lab. This is for what it is. Written out. It was written outside, but it was written. Um, we're, we're hoping this is compatible. And we've had uh, lab key involvement as this is written. So the first, we're actually testing this month uh, the first porting of one of those features, the clinical timelines, over to the, the lab key platform. Yeah, yeah, they're meant to work together. Right. Just, it's just like running a Western block in a laboratory, which would never work in closer by labs. We did a different way of doing it, so it's the same every time in a week or a lab across the country. It's just a lot of work to make that conversion. you say what the tools we use to do no. I know we're down to the last few seconds, 49 seconds to go. Um, so where we're going next year, multiple portals, the NLP pipeline, integrating these visualization features and continuing to explore them um, with Argos and Argoscape, and then the full deployment of the ability to deal with protected information and exporting that data, both technically and operational. So we're going, and this has been a huge team with, with multiple collaborators. I, I guess there's maybe 40 people overall at the, at the hutch from different groups working on this together, and together with our, our technology partners at Lefty. That's all I got. Thank you very much. Thank you both very much. Um, I think it's a great example of some of the things that Rick mentioned, the expansion of the platform into new spaces, new types of data that were really not allowed to have before, um, and laying that, that groundwork. Um, so I think we've learned something from the sequence of presentations uh, last year that we don't want to have uh, just a ton of giant projects um, all in a row because I know some folks who would come and were just exploring my piece server who were a little intimidated um, by seeing Hydra and some of the other um, very extensive big team uh, projects. 